bunch of breaking news, starting with what looks to be political violence in Virginia. A man walking into the office of a Democratic congressman, hitting two of his staffers with the bat, including an intern on day one of her job. How this attack seems to be part of a growing pattern of threats against members of Congress. Also tonight, the first look at that long-awaited so-called investigation into the Russia investigation from 2016. Years in the making, hundreds of pages, but maybe with more political implications than legal ones. Our team standing by live with a breakdown of the key headlines. Plus, in our backstory, how one author's extraordinary discovery could change the way we think and teach about the relationship between Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, the inside look at a bombshell transcript. And with the average monthly car payment now hitting, you're ready for this, more than $700, why more and more people are holding on to their cars longer than ever before. Then TV writers striking out front of the upfronts, a huge day for media companies that want to use new content to bring in eyeballs and bring in dollars. But what happens if both sides go weeks or maybe months without a deal? We'll explain later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air tonight with some breaking news. Those new details about a man who attacked the district office of a Virginia Democratic congressman, Jerry Connolly. Police say a man walked into the congressman's office in Fairfax, Virginia, that's in Northern Virginia this morning, with a metal baseball bat and attacked two people there, two staffers. One of them was an intern on just her first day on the job. Now listen, the congressman wasn't there at the time. He was not in his office at the time. But in his statement, he says that this person apparently asked for him before swinging that bat. The two people hurt are now in the hospital. Fortunately, their injuries are not expected to be life-threatening. The suspect's in custody. We know that this person, this attacker, is from Fairfax, per police, is a constituent of Connolly's. Both the U.S. Capitol Police and the local police department are investigating what happened. No official motive given yet. As we mentioned, a congressman put out the statement, right? You see it here, saying, the thought that someone would take advantage of my staff's accessibility to commit an act of violence is unconscionable and devastating. Put this into context, right, a bigger context. There have been more and more members of Congress speaking up about their safety concerns ever since the insurrection, back on January 6th. It's become an issue on both sides of the aisle, too, at least this specific Connolly one. You see Virginia's Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin saying violence does not belong in our political system. Remember, just last month, a man attacked the husband of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi at their San Francisco home. U.S. Capitol Police said last year they investigated something like 7,500 cases of potential threats against lawmakers, which are up, right? Threats are up more than 400 percent, roughly, in the last six years. I want to get to Sahil Kapoor with more on this. Bring us up to speed on the latest here. Hallie, we know from Capitol Police and local police that this attack took place just moments before 11 a.m. in Fairfax, Virginia. It's the suburbs of Washington, just a short drive away from Capitol Hill, uh, where you and I are right now. We know from uh, Capitol Police that the two congressional staffers were assaulted with a metal bat. There were non-life-threatening injuries. Uh, uh, local police have identified a 49-year-old man from uh, Fairfax as the suspect. Fairfax Police Sergeant Lisa Gardner has been speaking a little bit more about uh, some details there. Uh, she mentions that the uh, suspect hit two staff members in their upper bodies. They were injured, but both were conscious when the police arrived. And she spoke a little bit about the larger context in which uh, this is happening. Let's play some of what uh, she had to say. We are just extremely, extremely happy that this wasn't worse. It's, it's quite frankly scary that someone can just walk up to an office holding a baseball bat and just start swinging at innocent victims. And part of that context is the explosion of threats we've seen against members of Congress that in some cases spill over lead to violence against their family members, against their staff members, Hallie. In 2017, uh, Capitol Police recorded investigations of 3,939 uh, cases uh, uh, in terms of threats. In 2021, that skyrocketed to 9,625. That's a massive, massive surge, and that's the world we're living in today. Uh, members of Congress are more worried, have to be more worried about their own security than at any time that we've seen uh, in recently in the last few decades. One of the things the congressman brought up, Sahil, was this issue, this idea of accessibility. And that is kind of exactly the point for these local offices, right? They're supposed to be accessible. We are supposed to be able to walk into an office of our congressman locally and be able to talk to staff about whatever issue we're having, right? That also makes these places uniquely vulnerable. 
That's exactly right. And that is precisely the question that these local district offices will have to grapple with. If you want to be accessible, these kinds of things can happen. And if threats to members of Congress, if threats to district offices uh, are credible, if this kind of violence can happen, then every member of Congress is going to rethink how accessible they want to be. Is that the kind of world that people want to live in right now? It's a question for, for everyone. And Capitol Police talks about how decreasing uh, you know, the political rhetoric, the intensity of the political rhetoric can help uh, prevent these kinds of situations, Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, live for us there in Washington. Sahil, thank you for that reporting. We've got more breaking news tonight, this time out west. Three people have been killed, two officers hurt in a shooting that happened in New Mexico in the town of Farmington. A suspect was, I'm quoting here, confronted and killed on scene, police say. They also say that this person's identity is unknown. No other threats at this time. You're seeing some video here from the scene. The two officers who were shot were told are in stable condition tonight. It's obviously still a developing story. We'll bring you more info as we get it. Also breaking in just the last hour, a Justice Department special counsel's report years in the making is now finally out. The so-called investigation into the Russia investigation. And it accuses the FBI of acting negligently by opening that investigation in the first place, right, into former President Trump's alleged ties to Russia during the 2016 election. This report, it's known kind of shorthand colloquially around D.C. as the Durham report. That's because John Durham is the special counsel who ran this thing. And he says senior FBI personnel displayed, you see it here, a serious lack of analytical rigor in that 2016 and investigation, which led to, of course, Robert Mueller's own special counsel investigation. There's a lot here, but here's what you should know, right? Durham got appointed by Bill Barr, who used to be the attorney general under Donald Trump, to look into how this Russia investigation even started, right? The investigation into the investigation. But this new report does not recommend any new charges against FBI officials. The only two people Durham took to court during this whole process were found not guilty. Monica Alba is joining us now. Mon, let me use the words of our colleague Ken Delanian, who is also working on this story, that this Durham report may loom larger in politics than in law. On that note, we are already hearing from former President Trump seeming to prove out that notion. Talk us through this. I think that's the exact right assessment, Hallie. And you and I covered many Trump rallies in the last few years when he was running for re-election where he would talk about this Durham report. He was claiming that it would exonerate him for, quote, the crime of the century. He would bring it up time and time again. And so this is now something that in this 300-page report, there's plenty here that could be fodder for the former president to seize on, specifically some of these real indications that John Durham says the FBI made a series of missteps about. And so now we are hearing from the former president from his own social media site, Truth Social, where he is essentially talking about this as a very extensive investigation that reveals, he says, and concludes the FBI never should have launched the Trump-Russia probe. In other words, he says the American public was scammed and continues on talking about this in the larger context of what he has referred to with many inquiries and probes investigating things related to him as a witch hunt. So the politics of this, there's plenty for both sides to really seize on and latch on to here. And what's important to point out here, Hallie, is exactly what you referenced in the introduction here, that in these years, John Durham could have brought multiple cases. There were even some, there was some thinking he could potentially charge senior government officials, and that never really took place. So that is what you're gonna see the Attorney General, the Department of Justice likely point to. And we should also point out that John Durham submitted this report to Merrick Garland on Friday, and he decided to release it today without any changes, Hallie. Um, the, the, obviously, he takes aim at the FBI here. The FBI is out with its own statement on this report, saying we made a lot of the reforms Durham says we should make, essentially, um, and that this reinforces the importance of making sure the FBI does its work with objectivity and professionalism. Bottom line, um, it, it is not as though this report is landing like a bombshell to create a lot of new sort of policy or law enforcement changes, Monica. Again, saying nothing of the political explosiveness of this and, and what people in different parts of the uh, political spectrum will say, Mon, from like an actual tangible practical matter, few changes, it seems. Exactly. And that's also because DOJ did their own internal watchdog report on this, which yeah. was released back in 2019. And that already suggested some reforms, far more strict guidelines and regulations on how they go about getting some of these different FISA warrants and all this other stuff that really the former president has been talking about for a long time. They've already implemented some of those changes. So it isn't like this Durham report that's out now is going to really make any other policy changes that we should expect because the FBI says 
They already looked into them and then proposed new things that have already been put into place. Hallie. Monica Alba, live for us outside the White House. Mon, thank you. Appreciate it. To the border now with new data out of Homeland Security saying kind of the opposite of what had been predicted or expected for weeks here, that the number of people trying to cross the southern border is going down. Not up, right? It's going down fairly fast after that restrictive immigration policy came to an end at the end of last week. You see the numbers in the days leading up to the lifting of Title 42. That, of course, was that pandemic arrow rule that limited the number of people who could come over across the border. You saw crossings around 10, 11,000 end of last week. Then came Friday, right? Thursday, Friday. You see the delineating line here. Look at how the numbers drop there. Now, there's plenty of caveats on this, right? One top DHS official tells us it's too early to draw conclusions, but they think that it is a sign the overall broader plan could be working here. Watch. We are confident that, you know, the, the plan that we have developed uh, across the U.S. government to address these flows uh, will work uh, over time. And we are, uh, again, uh, going to be, uh, you know, keeping a very, very close eye on, on all of this as it unfolds. We're also learning tonight the White House is trying to expand its Border Patrol app to let something like 1,000 people cross legally every day. At the same time, DHS says it sent something like 2,400 people back to Mexico and other countries in the past few days. The big concern right now, lawsuits from both sides of the aisle. The White House says, well, this shows you just how broken the immigration system actually is. George Solis is live for us in El Paso, Texas. Let me show some of these pictures, George, of people you know, sleeping in the street near where you are in El Paso. You're talking with some of these folks who are hoping to be able to legally come into the U.S. Tell me about those conversations. Yeah, Hallie, it's important to remember that behind all of these numbers are real people, and yeah. these are the people that I have been speaking with here, the migrants that are sleeping on the sidewalks, the ones that are trying to cross over, the ones that are having difficulty navigating that CPP-1 app, trying to enter this country legally. Many of them saying they just wanted to get here to start a better life, and they are encountering all of these difficulties, starting with the rumor mill that kind of led to that surge of people trying to get here before Title 42 expired. Those that are here now dealing with the trials and tribulations of the new policies, where they're trying to, they're trying their hardest to understand all of it. Meanwhile, when you get to the port of entry for some of these migrants, they are finding that they are still being separated from their loved ones. I spoke to one grandmother who says she got here with her four-year-old grandson after encountering some unspeakable horrors all on the trek to the United States. And when she got here, she was separated from her four-year-old grandson yesterday. She said she was going to wait here until she could be reunited. Now, she's not so sure, Hallie. Talk me through, I mean, you make such an important point, George, of putting faces behind these numbers, because there are a lot of numbers. I mean, that is in some ways how you tell at least a part of this story is what we're seeing um, from people across the border here. DHS says there's something like 21,000 migrants who are at processing facilities. That means they're over capacity. At the same time, they say the crossings are down. Help us understand, if somebody is looking at this, right, and going, okay, so is the Biden plan working? Is the White House plan working or not? What's the answer to that? Is there a clear one? It's definitely no clear answer, and it really depends on who you ask. If you ask yeah. members of the Biden administration, of course, they'll say, yes, our plan and our warnings are working. But then again, you have the migrants here who say they're just trying to understand what all of this policy means to them. They feel like they're caught between policy and politics. They now worry that if they are trying to enter this country illegally, they may be banned for five years because they don't want to take that risk. So it is a very convoluted issue. And right now, with many of them being moved to other sanctuary cities, they really just don't no, they are playing the waiting game, and ultimately, they're just, like I said, they feel like they're caught in the middle of all of it. Hallie? George Solis, live for us there in El Paso. George, thank you. Back here at home to Florida now, where the Republican governor there, Ron DeSantis, is leaning into those so-called culture wars, maybe just days away from finally announcing what everybody thinks he's going to announce anyway, which is his own run for the White House come 2024. Here's the governor today signing a new bill that bans Florida's colleges and universities from spending money on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Watch. In fact, if you look at the way this has actually been implemented across the country, uh, DEI is, is better um, viewed as standing for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination. Not everybody likes that plan, obviously. You're seeing here a handful of demonstrators and protesters who were outside this news conference where this was all going down, ultimately mocked by the governor and the new college interim president. I was a little disappointed. I was hoping for more. It's this kind of kindergarten level protest. 
So DeSantis, again, leaning into these so-called culture war issues, whether it's DEI, right, whether it is thinking about what can be taught in Florida schools on abortion, for example, with now former President Trump taking a hit at DeSantis' six-week abortion ban, saying in a new interview with The Messenger, a lot of people don't even know if he knew what he was doing, but he signed six weeks. And many people, Donald Trump says, within the pro-life movement feel that was too harsh. I want to bring in Vaughn Hilliard covering all of this for us here. So what is interesting here are the tea leaves that I think we can read from what the governor is doing. He has been ramping up these culture war fights, quote unquote, for for weeks now, if not months, as as all signs seem to point to the fact that he is going to finally announce this presidential run. I mean, Vaughn, probably by Memorial Day. I think that's super fair to say, right? Right. And today, our own Matt Dixon was down in Tallahassee and snapped some photos of moving trucks of what is believed to be his campaign headquarters. So we're looking at over the next two weeks some time for that formal announcement to come out. But in the meanwhile, he was sort of previewing of what's to come or potentially to come here in Iowa as he made multiple retail stops across the state. Take a listen to a part of what he said, because he didn't take on Donald Trump by name directly, but it's pretty clear who he's talking about. I think the party has uh, developed a, a culture of losing. I think that there's uh, not uh, accountability. And I think in Florida, we really showed what it takes uh, to not just win, win big, and then deliver big. He went on to say the time for excuses is over, and it's no coincidence that somebody is, uh, a Florida governor is roaming around the Midwest. You know, this is really, for Ron DeSantis, a moment in which his soup, the super PAC that is aligned with him has already spent $10 million, and now it's really a moment of, do you get in this race or do you not? Because there's only nine months until the Iowa caucus. It's time to get going if, in fact, he does this. Not that you're counting nine months till the Iowa caucus, but here's what I'd say is that the issue of abortion will be front and center, right. um, likely in that state in particular, and in others, of course, in this Republican primary. You heard Donald Trump go after Ron DeSantis on, frankly, policy here, right? Where should an abortion ban be? Where is the line? This is something that members of the GOP are talking about. But Donald Trump himself is also vulnerable on exactly that, Vaughn. Explain. Right. I mean, this is a dance that several of these candidates are playing, but it's a dance of a very sensitive subject. We're talking about abortion. And Donald Trump's suggesting that perhaps the six-week abortion ban that Ron DeSantis signed this year into law is, quote, too harsh. But then he went on to say that he's looking at all options in terms of what type of federal legislation he would sign himself, and that potentially being a six-week ban as well. And so all of this is playing out here in in real time over very sensitive subjects as Donald Trump is trying to figure out where Ron DeSantis is on some of these issues that are very important to the Republican electorate. Vaughn Hilliard, thank you very much for that Thanks, reporting. Ron. Appreciate it. In just the last hour, we're hearing from the Treasury Secretary that June 1st, right, June 1st, potentially early June is still the time period they're looking at is when the U.S. will basically run out of money to pay its bills. It's this whole debt ceiling crisis we've been talking about. As we're getting some kind of surprisingly chill vibes from President Biden about the potential for an economic meltdown if they don't figure out a plan here, he doesn't seem to be sweating it, even as House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is kind of ahead of this meeting at the White House tomorrow. Listen. There's no progress that I see, and it really concerns me with the timeline of where we are. I remain optimistic because I'm a congenital optimist, but I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. Just remember, what we're talking about here is the U.S. basically running out of money to pay its bills. If that happens, if this X date, whether it's June 1st or June 8th or whatever goes by, and we can't, you could look at a recession, experts say, a crash of the stock market, higher interest rates. All of that is what could be on the table if that deadline is missed. And here's the thing. With roughly 15 days to go, Wall Street doesn't seem to be all that worried either. Chill vibes there, too. Look at the numbers. The Dow, the S&P, the Nasdaq all closing up. And you know who else is feeling fairly chill? Most of us, right? Most people are yawning about this with our team having some new reporting showing that this whole debt ceiling crisis is only abstract to people right now compared to all of the very real issues that people see around them every day. Think about what you're paying for groceries or whatever. Garrett Hake is joining us now. Can I just be really transparent with you? Like, Please. When, when we talk about a story, we're like, wow, not much news here today. We yeah. typically wouldn't then cover it on the news. And that is kind of the thing that's happening around debt ceiling talks, at least right now. However, that could change and probably will change on a dime. 
Yeah, look, there's some recency bias with this in the sense that, like, this has never happened. But we know it would be bad, but because it's never happened. You mean a default? Like, yeah, if the U.S. Yeah. missed the deadline, couldn't pay our bills, yeah, we've but we've never, never done, done that. it. So yeah. it won't happen. Surely it won't happen. But because if it does, the results are so bad, we have to keep talking about it. I'm as interested in the vibes as you are. Like, Biden in the bicycle helmet right. is the You're ultimate like, chill we're, vibe. We're, we're going to be fine. But the yeah. way I see it isn't that McCarthy's stressed about it. The way I see it is McCarthy thinks he's got the stronger hand. And mm -hmm. so he wants to keep the pressure up here. What's worked for him every step of the way here is pressure. Pass a bill, increase the pressure. Treasury says the deadline's June 1. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Joe Biden's supposed to leave the country in two days. That's right. More pressure. So if Kevin McCarthy comes out and says, these guys aren't serious, they're not even really talking to me yet, that jams the White House a little bit. And by the way, if it makes Biden look bad or get asked questions about it while he's in Japan or Australia, all the better. You're saying that Kevin McCarthy wants to put the pressure ball back in the Biden court at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, look, Biden hasn't even admitted that they're having negotiations. They're having negotiations in air quotes because the White House doesn't want to even say they're talking about this issue that we all know they're talking about. Well, they've so. insisted we're not negotiating. The idea being like, this is not negotiable. They want to semantically frame it as... Like when I tell my kid, well, it's non negotiable. You yeah, are not going to. Yeah, gonna, but they're you know. just also sitting around a room having a conversation about the thing they're not negotiating about, right? Like, well, it, So, in this pretend negotiation, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> what's on the table, right? Because Sahil Kapoor, our colleague there on the Hill, is talking with um, House Rules Chair Tom Cole. I'm not going to get too in the weeds about mm -hmm. it, but the idea, like, what is on, if they're negotiating, whether it's in quotes or not, what is actually at the core here? Money that they could take right now, so that's things like clawing back COVID money that hasn't been spent. There's this idea of permitting reform, which is a fancy way of saying making energy projects easier. It's something Republicans have wanted forever. They can kind of shoehorn it in all of this. And Washington's favorite thing, spending caps. Let's just promise we're not going to spend more money in the future. Then we don't actually have to cut anything now. Because how's, how's that worked before? Not great, but it lets everybody declare a win. When do the chill vibes become like, let's get it done, oh no vibes? I don't know, probably Memorial Day when people have to start canceling vacations to sit in Washington and hammer out a deal. Garrett Hake, I'm sure you'll be among them, potentially. No. Thank you, sir, appreciate you. Overseas now, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is heading back home tonight with the pledge of new military support from allies in Europe ahead of what everybody expects to be an attack on Russian forces. You have Zelensky tweeting a video saying, we are returning home with new defense packages, more new and powerful weapons, more protection for our people, more political for support. The political support he's talking about comes after the meetings that you're seeing here on screen, right? Leaders in the UK, France, Germany, Italy, where Zelensky, by the way, also met with the Pope. Back at his home, you have the Ukrainian military saying that it's forced the Russians to retreat more than a mile from Bakhmut, a major key city in the eastern Donbass region. Kier Simmons is joining us now. So Zelensky is heading back home, basically saying, look at everything we have secured. Money, billions of dollars in help from Germany, tanks, anti-aircraft system, equipment, the stuff that they have long wanted to see and that have been asking for and in some cases getting. How is this at all? Um, how is this a game changer if it is at all, Kier? Oh, Hallie, we're at a crucial point. I mean, it's absolutely a pivotal point right now. And yet at the same time, and here's, I suppose, the irony, uh, we don't know uh, what exactly is going on because it's a battlefield. And we certainly don't know what is going to happen in the months ahead. So look, what we're going to see is going to change the course of history, but it's very, very difficult to predict. Now, look, I mean, uh, you're right. President Zelensky has walked away with some uh, pretty, look, look, pretty hefty agreements, uh, you know, long-term, long-range attack drones from the UK. That offer from uh, Germany of almost $3 billion worth of military aid. I mean, that is pretty stunning, actually, from the Germans, who honestly, to, really, you just think back a year, were kind of having to be dragged along to provide aid. They wouldn't put it that way, but, but that's the way many people view it. So, uh, yes, has Zelensky uh, managed to help his military? Yes, he has. What impact will it have? We don't know, because uh, honestly, actually, uh, you mentioned, for example, Bakhmut. It, it, it's very, very difficult for journalists to get there to assess what is happening. Everyone's been talking about the spring offensive by the Ukrainians, right? Um, it hasn't started yet, but Zelensky is saying it is coming. Talk about that, right? Because you lay it out, I think, well, Kier, pivotal point, pivotal moment. What's happening in Bakhmut is in some ways a bit of a black box to outside journalists who are relying on the word of the Ukrainians, the, not, not relying on the word of the Russians, but hearing yeah. what they have to say about it. Um, t talk us through that. 
Yeah, I mean, ultimately, um, y you're right. Uh, we do hear, we have heard from a guy called Evgeny Pr Prigozhin, who's the head of the Wagner Group, who people will, many people watching will know about. You know, he's been really outspoken in criticizing uh, the Russian military. He runs his own kind of paramilitary force. He described as the front as collapsing, uh, as the flanks as crumbling in the Russian military. Now, that's not the way the Russian military itself would put it, uh, around, around Bakhmut. Uh, so, uh, he is painting a picture of Russia really struggling to hold the line. I do think that's one of the reasons why you're seeing the Russians fire um, these, uh, these uh, air artillery, artillery and, and drones and things. I think they're trying to do something about the Ukrainian supply lines and try and prevent the Ukrainians from la launching an effective spring offensive. I mean, the important thing about all this is, and I, I think you may get to this, Hallie, but let me just set it up. I mean, I think the important thing ab about all this is that at some point there are going to be negotiations. That's We're right. seeing Chinese diplomats running around Europe. Uh, we saw Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor in Europe, talking to the Chinese. At some point, there are going to be negotiations. What are the battle lines going to look like at that point? That's going to be crucial. Well, those negotiations set to happen, I mean, this coming week. We expect to see that over the next few days, right? Yeah, what we do, the Chinese envoy is going to go to Ukraine right. and Russia and France and Germany. Yeah, but, I, you know, uh, clearly the Chinese are trying to put themselves in the middle of this. I would right. describe it like this, I think, with Beijing. I can't speak for Beijing. I'm, I'm not uh, from the Chinese government, obviously. But, you know, I would say they, they very likely want to see Russia supported as strong as possible, but at the same time, they'd like to see this wrapped up. Again, though, that paints a picture. The Chinese probably aren't too concerned about what the territorial situation is at the end, whereas Ukraine and its supporters, like here in the UK, they do care, and that's why Ukraine is being aided to try and gain territory before, finally, there are proper talks. Keir Simmons, uh, thank you so much for that reporting, as always, Keir, and the reported analysis, too. Appreciate it. Coming up, some big news from Microsoft, because regulators overseas have greenlit its deal to buy Activision Blizzard. Why the tech world is talking all about this tonight, plus some new travel numbers from AAA that may have you rethinking your Memorial Day plans. That's in our five things. With cars getting more and more expensive, more and more of us are now spending more and more money to fix our old cars rather than replace them with new ones. Guess how long people on average keep their cars? 12 and a half years, you see that? 12 and a half years is the average age of a car on the road right now. The pandemic made cars more expensive because of all those huge shipping delays, the manufacturing backlogs, and the prices haven't really gone down since. Then you add ballooning loan rates on new car purchases, right, because of all those interest rate hikes. It's moved the national average of auto loan payments to a record $730 a month. Is that a number, another number that's going to blow your mind? People are paying more than 700 bucks a month for a new car. So it means more people are now choosing to stick with what they have, even if it means spending more on repairs and maintenance. Caleb Silver is joining us now. Let me tell you, I know that it can cost a lot of money to do repair and maintenance on a car, right? But there is a reason for this. It's because new cars are expensive. Just since 2020, since the pandemic, the cost of a new car is up 24%. Used cars are higher than that even, up 40%. So even though fixing up an old car isn't like cheap per se, it's cheaper, right? Is that the right economic move? Yeah, for some people, and remember, a new car is the ultimate discretionary spend unless you need it right. for your business. We're talking about $48,000 for the average price for a new car. You mentioned that uh, that payment, that 711 bucks a month. That's only if you're super prime. So just think about the interest rate you're going to be paying if you have to buy a new car. And a lot of people are choosing, as you said, to repair their car, keep their car longer. 284 million cars on the road right now. It's a little bit more than there were last year, but we're keeping them longer and we're spending more to fix them up. That's why you see stocks like O'Reilly Automotive and AutoZone. These stocks are at 52-week highs. The rest of the market kind of bouncing around. These stocks are doing great because we are not, as Americans, willing to make that big discretionary purchase. It's just too much money right now.
Did you say the average price of a new car in this country is $48,000? Of a new car, and a used car is around $26,800. Nothing is wow. cheap here, and if you're financing it, we're talking about big payments giving the, given the rise in loans for cars, used cars and new cars. And if you have great credit, it's still pretty high. So no matter what, you're going to be paying a lot every month. That's why you're seeing so many old cars on the road. And car technology, as you know, has come a long way in the yeah. last 12 or so years. I think people are still rolling up their window with some of these older cars with the hand crank. EVs, by the way, the average age there, about three years for electric vehicles. People are also keeping those longer, even though automakers are bringing a lot of new EVs to the market. Well, I don't know about hand cranks, but for sure CD players. I mean, I feel like that is something that's in a ton of cars that are on the road, most likely. Um, what does it mean for the car industry more broadly? If, everybody's ha if a lot of people are hanging on to their old cars here, is there going to be at some point like a tipping point? Oh, there already has been, and that's why you've seen Ford, GM, and the big automakers say, mm. we're going to stop producing gas-using cars over the next few years, going to go fully electric, because that's where they know the demand is, and that's where they know the, dem the demand is going to be. But they need to sell a certain amount of cars every month just to stay profitable. They're having a hard time doing that. They've been having a hard time the last couple of years. Caleb Silver, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Supreme Court is siding with an Alabama death row inmate fighting against the use of lethal injection. Kenneth Smith claims the pain caused by that injection would have violated his right to be free of cruel and unusual punishment. He's instead requesting the state use a lethal gas. Smith was sentenced to death after being convicted in a 1988 murder for hire, originally set to be executed back in November. Number two, a 78-year-old U.S. citizen, 78-year-old American, has been sentenced to life in prison by a Chinese court on spying charges. He was arrested two years ago, but no other details about the case have been made public. Spy cases in China are often held behind closed doors. This American holds permanent residency in Hong Kong. The U.S. State Department declining to comment. Number three, Microsoft's proposed $69 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard, that gaming company. It is one step closer to reality. Remember, this is the company that brought us Call of Duty, World of Warcraft. The EU has now given its stamp of approval for this. That is a big deal after regulators in the UK blocked this whole thing. They had claimed the agreement would cut down on competition too much. If you're wondering about the approval process here in the U.S., it is still ongoing. Number four, experts over AAA think travel on Memorial Day weekend will be one for the record books. Their words, not mine. They're projecting more than 42 million of us will travel at least 50 miles from home for the sort of unofficial kickoff to summer. That's a lot of people. They're going to be on the highways, at the train stations, at airports. It's up 7% from last year. Air travel alone is expected to get 11% higher than what we saw in 2020. 2022. Number five, we here at the show would like to wish a very happy birthday to Bobby. The people at the Guinness Book of World Records say this little, this little guy, this little nugget, Portuguese pup, oldest dog in the world. He's 31 years old. He's lived in the same village his whole life. Of course, his owner threw him a party, meat and fish for the people and for the doggy guests as well. When we come back, voters in Turkey are going to have to head to the polls again and soon because no candidate got enough support over the weekend. Why it matters so much to Americans, right? Why it's going to be a big deal here, coming up. Turkey tonight is gearing up for a runoff election coming up at the end of this month after both candidates failed to win a clear majority of the vote with millions of people headed to polls over the weekend. Who ends up winning there could matter a lot here in the U.S. Why? Turkey is one of the U.S.'s biggest NATO allies and plays a key part in negotiations between Ukraine and Russia. The incumbent, President Recep Erdogan, has led Turkey for 20 years, and many see this election as his toughest political challenge yet, with some critics blaming it on a really bad economic situation there and that huge earthquake that displaced millions of people earlier this year. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez is joining us now live. Um, Turkey's been through quite a bit this year, right? And now they're on the precipice of this really kind of dramatic moment as it relates to this runoff election here. What should we be expecting, right? And explain why it matters to people here in the U.S. Yeah, Holly, the stakes really high here, both for the future of Turkey's democracy and for the future of Turkey's relationship with the rest of NATO, with the West. Overall, 
President Erdogan had a pretty good night. He has a lot of momentum going into this second round. Remember, he was trailing in the polls going into election night. The opposition really thought that there was a chance that they could end his 20 years in power, that they could knock him out in the first round. And instead, he won the most votes. I want to show you a couple of numbers, Hallie. Erdogan winning about 49.5% of the vote. His opponent, Kilic Dorolu, trailing on about 45% of the vote. And and then about 6% going to a couple of third party candidates who will be eliminated going into the second round. Their votes will be up for grabs on this next election on May 28th. And Hallie, some of our viewers may be wondering, is this election legit, given everything we know about Erdogan, right. given everything we know about his authoritarian tendencies? And what I can say is the opposition at this point, they are complaining about how state media covered the election, but they are not at this stage anyway accusing Erdogan of voter fraud. Hallie. What happens if Erdogan doesn't win, Raf? How does that change um, the U.S.-Turkish relationship? Yeah, big deal in lots of ways. Erdogan is kind of one of the OG authoritarian populist leaders, right, Hallie? Before there was Trump, before there was Bolsonaro, there was Erdogan. So for people who care about the fate of democracy around the world, it mm -hmm. would really matter if he was out of office. His challenger, Kilic Dorolu, has also promised to lead Turkey in a kind of more unambiguously pro-Western direction. Erdogan has been a very cantankerous, should we say, NATO leader. He is holding up Sweden's entry into the NATO alliance. Alliance. He's refused to join Western sanctions against Russia. And Kilic Dorolu has said he will be a better team player, if you will, inside NATO if he does end up becoming president after this next stage of the election on May 28th. Hallie. Raf Sanchez, live for us on that. Raf, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight we're looking at an extraordinary new revelation about one of the defining tensions of the civil rights era. The fiery criticism by Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. aimed at Malcolm X, arguably the two biggest black leaders of that era. But it turns out that criticism may have come from thin air. The writer, Jonathan Icke, discovered this full, never before published transcript of a long 1965 Playboy interview with MLK showing he may not have said what the article says he did. I want to show you kind of the side-by-side -side comparison, right? In the Playboy article, Dr. King is quoted as saying, I feel that Malcolm has done himself and our people a great disservice. But in the full transcript, that line doesn't show up anywhere. When the article says Dr. King said, and I'm quoting, fiery demagogic oratory in the black ghettos, urging Negroes to arm themselves and prepare to engage in violence can achieve nothing but negative results, right? That line from MLK, that seems like he's criticizing Malcolm X. But look at the transcript. Turns out that line shows up way earlier in the interview in a totally different context that has nothing to do with Malcolm X. So how did this happen? controversy focuses on this guy, Alex Haley, the super famous journalist who did that 1965 interview with MLK. He's a big deal. Even wrote a book about Malcolm X. Haley's Pulitzer Prize winning novel Roots inspired that very popular TV show of the same name. But over the years, she's faced a lot of criticism for alleged plagiarism and for lying. Jonathan Eig is the author of King, A Life, which comes out tomorrow. He joins us now. So talk about this, because for, for decades, this matters, right? For decades, this MLK interview has been held up as kind of this defining tension of the civil rights era between two of the most prominent black leaders at the time. Tell us, how did you even come about this, this these transcripts as you were doing research for the book? How did that even happen? King and Malcolm X have always been portrayed as antagonists. And the longest interview we have with King is the interview that appeared in Playboy magazine. And that interview was conducted by Alex Haley. So anytime I find a really good interview, I go to the archives. I try to find the notes or the tapes from that interview to see what was left out of the story. And in this case, I found Alex Haley's notes, or the transcripts of his interviews, at the uh, University Library at Duke. And those transcripts were very different from what was published in Playboy magazine. And many of the quotes that, was, that were published, where King was most critical of Malcolm X, were not in the transcripts at all. King never said most of them. So I was shocked and um, really felt like 
the record needed to be set straight because history teachers, um, especially African American history teachers in yeah. colleges, have been teaching that quote for 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 decades, for generations. So then how did you sort of wrestle down this revelation? In other words, like once you kind of got past the initial shock of like, wow, this thing may not be what it seems based on these transcripts, you then, you know, went, went about directly disputing this narrative that, as you point out, is built into in some worlds of academia, right, into classroom settings, et cetera. Well, first I broke it down. I, I really analyzed the two documents carefully, the published interview and the transcript to see what King actually said. And it's important because what he actually said is, I don't like Malcolm's calls to violence, but I also don't believe that I have all the answers. So he was suggesting an openness to mm -hmm. talking to Malcolm and to understanding where Malcolm was coming from. And that's very different from what we're teaching. So I discovered this uh, about a year ago and I had to sit on it for a while um, because I wanted to save it for my book, of course. But at the same time, I shared it with a lot of uh, history professors around the country to make sure they knew about it and that they would uh, begin to think about how to teach this differently and also to learn from them, to get advice from them on, on why this mattered, really. There is also, you have described a level of urgency here to the work that you're doing, specifically as it relates to, um, to, to Dr. King here. You said in an interview that we were interested in with the New York Times Book Review that if your approach to the book, if I do nothing but travel the country for the next year or two, interviewing people who knew MLK, my time will have been well spent. Explain that, right? Because time is not an infinite resource here. Well, it ended up being six years, um, but I still think it was time well spent because I had the opportunity to meet people who knew and worked with Martin Luther King Jr. And when I told my kids about this, they thought it was impossible. They thought Martin Luther King Jr. must be 200 years old by now. But in fact, he'd only be 94. And in fact, his older sister is still alive. And I found dozens of people who knew him well, childhood playmates. I found his barber. I found the pianist, the organist at his church um, in, in Montgomery. So I was just having the best time of my life and learning so much. How did you, you know, and you, you touched on this a bit, too, in that same interview, but I want to draw this out more here, how you approached wanting to add this, this sort of new telling of one of America's most prominent black leaders as yourself a white man at a time where there may be people who were looking for somebody who might have a different lived experience in, in this kind of writing here. How did you think about that? With humility, I mean, anytime you enter into a biography of any subject, you're taking someone else's life in your own hands. When you take Dr. King's life in your own hands, as someone who's an icon, especially an icon mm -hmm. in the black community, you have to work extra hard and be extra sensitive. And I tried to surround myself with experts. I tried to learn from the people who knew King and to learn from our best historians so that I could um, you know, make up for whatever blind spots I might have, but also just account for my gaps with hard work. And um, as I said, the opportunity to, to interview um, people before, you know, we lose the last living witnesses to King's life was just too important. I couldn't resist. Jonathan Ike, thank you so much for talking us through the behind the scenes look at how this all came together. Uh, quite the story. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up here on the show, a big Philadelphia newspaper is scrambling, saying a cyber attack prevented it from printing Sunday. What we know about the investigation, plus more controversy for John Morant to the Grizzlies, the new video that got him suspended from team activities after the break. NBA star John Morant has been suspended again for appearing to flash a gun in a video online. We're going to show you it. Morant reportedly on an Instagram live video over the weekend waving what looks like a gun as he's in a car with a friend. His team, the Memphis Grizzlies, says he's suspended from all team activities pending league review. Now, the team's out of the playoffs already, so it's not like any games are going to be missed this season. But remember, Morant was suspended already for eight games back in March after he was seen on Instagram live. Again, holding a gun at a nightclub. Valerie Castro is joining us now. Um, this could really affect... The, uh, like an extremely um, high-profile player here, right? Like a talented star for the Grizzlies next season because reporters who follow the league say he could be suspended next year even though the Grizzlies are out of the playoffs now. What is going on here? Well, Hallie, so we went to the managing editor for NBC Sports, Kurt Heelan. He's the expert on all things NBA. He tells me that the punishment this time will likely be much harsher. As you mentioned, he faced an eight-game suspension the last time this happened. Uh, Heelan believes this time it'll be in the double digits, and there's also the possibility of fines. Now, the league has not issued any statement on this. We reached out to them for any comment, and they did not get back to us. Uh, but again, the belief is that the league will come down much harder on Morant this time, given that this appears to be the second 
time that this has happened, Hallie. Um, his jersey, like we talk about who John Moran is, like, and people who watch this show know that, like, I'm not particularly like a basketball fan, um, but he is a big deal in the basketball world, right? His jersey was the sixth most sold jersey of any player this season. He's right up there with Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, LeBron, etc. Um, what does this latest sort of gun waving incident mean to not just the Grizzlies, but to the league writ large? And what have we heard from the league? Well, as we said, we've reached out to the league and we haven't heard back. But, uh, you know, when you talk about these pro athletes, the big thing here is endorsements. Uh, you mentioned his jersey. He also has a deal right now with Nike, a big sneaker deal. They dropped uh, one shoe just a few weeks ago. It was incredibly popular, as to be expected. He's got another shoe coming out in just a few weeks. So everyone is waiting to see if Nike has any comment. We reached out. Uh, they did not get back to us. He's got another deal with Powerade. And the last time this happened back in March, Powerade already had a video on YouTube uh, featuring Morant, and that has since been taken down. They did not get back to us with any comment. But again, it's it's big money for these pro athletes, so he right. could potentially be leaving a lot of money on the table. And I get that we reached out to the league and haven't heard back on this incident, but it's not like this hasn't happened before. And the last time that it did, the commissioner called out what John Morant was doing is, I'm quoting here, irresponsible, reckless, and potentially very dangerous, pointing out that, like, there are young people who look up to him and others. Right, and this doesn't appear to be anything illegal that he did, but this could be an right. image problem for the league. Sports analysts tell us uh, they will come down on him hard. It'll likely be a double-digit suspension. And he's got a five-year deal. It's worth nearly $200 million. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see exactly what the consequences are of this latest incident, Hallie. Valerie Castro, thank you very much. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, an eighth horse has died this month at Churchill Downs, the home of the Kentucky Derby, of course. The three-year-old colt Rio Moon hurt its left front leg right after the start of a race and had to be euthanized. Remember, two horses were killed after injuries on the same day as the Derby, the five other deaths happened in the days leading up to that race. In a statement, the track says it's investigating all of it. Out of our Western Bureau, a pitcher for the Colorado Rockies is recovering after a skull fracture when he was hit by a line drive. Ryan Feltner was hit in the back of the head Saturday by a ball traveling 93 miles an hour. Amazingly, he's out of the hospital. He's not going to need surgery. The team says he's probably going to be off the field for weeks, if not months. A lot of people, of course, thinking tonight of that 26-year-old. Out of our Northeast Bureau, the Philadelphia Inquirer was not able to go to print yesterday after what the newspaper calls a cyber attack. It's an especially problematic a time for something like this to happen because, remember, the mayor's race, the primary in the mayor's race is happening tomorrow. Printing operations were back up and running in time for the paper to go out this morning. The FBI has is apparently joining the investigation into what happened. Still to come, TV's so-called Upfronts Week getting upstaged by the Hollywood writer strike. What's different this year and how the fall schedule could be affected. Next. That Hollywood writer's strike today casting a shadow over the start of a big week for big media companies as they try to charm advertisers at what's called the upfronts. Our parent company, NBC Universal, and Fox kicked off day one. But look, there were people outside, too, protesters from the Writers Guild. This is right outside Radio City Music Hall with the strike now hitting its third week. It means productions of a lot of shows are off. They are on pause for now. The upfronts, you know, really try to focus on showing advertisers what they're going to see this year, content-wise, like the new shows, whatever, the new movies. And now also trying to convince people their favorite shows and movies won't be too affected by the strike. NBC Universal, in particular, having to acknowledge not just the strike, but another elephant in the room, Linda Yaccarino, its global ad chief, resigning just days ago to replace Elon Musk as Twitter CEO. I want to bring in NBC's Dana Griffin. So what was interesting, it seems like the headline from the upfronts has been what we said, right? What we laid out, the shadow of the writer's yep. strike kind of hanging over these things. Explain that. Mm hmm yeah, well, the big uncertainty here is what's going to happen and how long this is going to draw draw out. Because if there are no writers, Hallie, there are no shows that could make way for more reality TV because you don't really necessarily need writers. Um, but obviously, both sides are eager to land a deal because you, you've got the writers who want to work and want to provide for themselves and their families. You've also got the big networks that are trying to make money, especially in an economy like this, Hallie. 
Speaking of an economy like this, you know, the companies, obviously, the media companies want to make money. Are advertise What's the sense from advertisers? Are they feeling a little skittish about this strike? The last one we had was years and years ago. It's not like there's a directly, it's not like this happens every six months. You know, I, I can't speak for the advertisers, but obviously it was very prominent, even with NBC Universal's upfront, that they talked about the need for advertising. And even though we've moved mm. over to streaming, they kept honing in on the need for more advertisement dollars and the need for more commercials. So that kind of gives you a little sense of, you know, the fact that they're appealing to these ad execs to say, hey, this is what we need. And these are the new shows we have and we want your money and, and put it bet on it with us. Right, exactly. We mentioned, too, Linda Yaccarino leaving. She's somebody who is a big sort of name, a big force here at NBC Universal, going over to Twitter yeah. um, to, to mm -hmm. run Twitter, to be its CEO and take over for Elon Musk, who will still obviously remain tied to the company here. Talk us through how that played a, played yeah. a part today, if at all. Well, it was addressed. It was kind of one of the elephants in the room today at NBC Universal's uh, up front. Uh, you had the streaming chairman, Mark Lazarus, you know, say that, you know, we wish her well. So mm -hmm. it was brought up today, but the, the focus was more so on, you know, trying to put out that NBC has all these different platforms and so many different ways of branding ourselves from sports to to reality to scripted to news and one thing that was notably missing or just not as prominent were the star power that you usually see at these upfronts. Um, some of the things that we noticed was during uh, one of the segments, you had some of the Writer Guild uh, of, of America members were appearing on TV. They were in these uh, pre-recorded segments that mm. were were taped before the strike happened instead of being there in person. Also, uh, it, there was one segment that talked about the 50th anniversary of SNL. That's a major deal, but not one former or past uh, co-host mm. or member or cast member was there. Even Willie Geist joked about, you know, if you squint, you know, I may look like Colin Joe. So that just goes to show that the absence of that may make advertisers kind of question, well, how's, you know, how is everything going? But NBC, I could speak for NBC because that's the one that we uh, watched today. They were trying to say, hey, we've got more shows coming and we're doing well. And hopefully that resonates with these um, ad execs. Hallie? Dana Griffin, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That does it for us this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right here, right now. Coming on the air with a bunch of breaking news, starting with what looks to be political violence in Virginia. A man walking into the office of a Democratic congressman, hitting two of his staffers with a baseball bat, including an intern on the first day of her job. How this attack seems to be part of a growing pattern of threats against members of Congress. Also tonight, the first look at that long-awaited so-called investigation into the Russia investigation from 2016. Years in the making, hundreds of pages, but maybe with more political implications than legal ones. Our team standing by live to break down the key headlines you should know. Plus, the Department of Homeland Security is out with some new numbers tonight, saying the number of people crossing the southern border is actually down by half over the last week, even though their own projections had it doubling, perhaps, once a key immigration policy ended. We're live with a look at the border with how it's all going. And in our backstory, how one author's extraordinary discovery could change the way we think and teach about the relationship between Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, the inside look at a bombshell transcript. Then with the average monthly car payment now hitting more than $700, that's a lot of money. Why more Americans are holding onto their cars longer than ever before. That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and we're coming on the air tonight with some breaking news. Those new details about somebody who attacked the district office of a Virginia Democrat, Congressman Jerry Connolly. Police say somebody walked into the congressman's office today in Fairfax, Virginia. That's just across the river from where we are in Washington. He had a metal baseball bat and apparently attacked two staffers there. One of them was just an intern on her first day in the job. The congressman was not at his office at the time, but he says the suspect apparently asked for him before swinging that bat. The two people hurt were taken to the hospital. Their injuries are unfortunately not expected to be life-threatening, and this attacker is in custody. Here's what we know. He's 49 years old from Fairfax. He's a constituent of Connolly's, so he lives in the district. Both the U.S. Capitol Police and the local police department are investigating this thing with no official motive yet. 
Congressman Connolly putting out a statement on the attack saying the thought that someone would take advantage of my staff's accessibility, he says, to commit an act of violence is unconscionable and devastating. We are also hearing from the Republican governor of Virginia, Glenn Youngkin, who is out with a statement tonight saying that violence does not belong in our political system. Keep in mind, putting this into context, right, there have been more and more members of Congress speaking up about their concerns ever since the insurrection back on January 6th. We have seen attacks related to political violence before. Look at what happened just last year, right, when the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was attacked at their home in San Francisco. U.S. Capitol Police said last year they investigated something like 7,500 cases of potential threats against lawmakers, a number that's up something like 400 percent over the last six years. The number's gone up 400 percent. I want to get to Saho Kapoor with more on this. We talked big picture. Let's go down to, like, the micro here and specifically this attack in northern Virginia. What else do we know? Tell us more. Hallie, we know that attack took place just moments before 11 a.m. today in broad daylight in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a prosperous suburb of Washington, D.C., a short drive away from Capitol Hill, from South uh, D.C., where we are now. We know from uh, Capitol Police that, uh, that they're, uh, along with local police, investigating this attack, that uh, according to Fairfax Police Sergeant Lisa Gardner, that the two staffers of uh, Congressman Connolly were hit in their upper bodies. The two staffers were, uh, were injured, but were both conscious when police arrived. As you mentioned, that they've identified a 49-year-old man from Fairfax as the suspect. It is not clear what their motive is. This is not someone that uh, local police uh, particularly had on their radar. This is not someone that Capitol Police had on their radar before. So that creates a new layer to this investigation. Who is this man? Why did he commit an act like that? Is it politically motivated? Uh, we'll be, we'll hopefully be getting answers to a lot of those questions going forward. Uh, the uh, Fairfax police chief talked about some of the, the bigger picture questions at stake here and, you know, the, uh, surrounding this attack. Let's play some more of what she had to say. We are just extremely, extremely happy that this wasn't worse. It's, it's quite frankly scary that someone can just walk up to an office holding a baseball bat and just start swinging at innocent victims. And Congressman Connolly says that while he wasn't in the office at the time, that the uh, suspect asked for him before he assaulted his staffer. So apparently he was the target. The congressman was the target of this uh, attempted assault. How much do you hear about concerns for members of Congress of safety from the people that you cover there on Capitol Hill, Sahil? We laid out the bigger picture context here, the increased number of threats that Capitol Police say they've seen in just the last, you know, six years or so. Um, how, how relevant is that to the lives of the people that you're talking to there? It surged enormously. It's a huge concern to members of Congress and the entire Capitol Hill community. We've seen how, it, uh, you know, uh, attempts to attack members of Congress can sometimes lead to violence against their family. We saw that in the case of the Pelosi's. Uh, we're now seeing it in the case of Congressman Connolly, how it can lead to uh, violence against staff members. You see these two numbers on the screen here, cases uh, on threats against lawmakers invested by Capitol Police. In 2017, it was less than 4,000. In 2021, the year that began with the January 6th attack on the Capitol, this surged to more than 9,600. That is the context uh, that we are living in right now, Hallie. And Capitol Police Chief Tom Manger says, uh, quote, while their work is ongoing, everyone continuing to decrease violent political rhetoric across the country is the best way to keep everyone safe, unquote. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much. Appreciate your reporting for us tonight. Thanks. We've got more breaking news tonight. Three people are dead, two officers hurt in a shooting out west in New Mexico in Farmington. The governor, in just the last hour, saying she's grateful for the quick response by law enforcement. I want to show you here some video of that scene tonight in that state. Two officers, the ones who were hurt, they're in stable condition. The suspect in this shooting was, I'm quoting here, confronted and killed on scene, according to police. They also say that the person's identity is not known to them at this time, but there are no other threats. It's still a developing story. We're going to bring you more info, any of it, as we get it. Down to the border now, where new data from Homeland Security says a little bit of the opposite of what they had been projecting for weeks now, that the number of people crossing the southern border is actually going down, not going up. And it's going down fast in the days after that restrictive immigration policy came to an end. It's known as Title 42, right? That pandemic era rule that was put in place that limited how many people could cross the border. You see where it was lifted. That's that dotted line right in the middle of the screen between May 11th and May 12th. Happened Thursday night. 
before it was lifted, you see the number of people who were trying to cross into the country, 11,000, 10,000. Now, most recent numbers, down to like half that, 4,400, 4,100. One top DHS official saying it's too early to draw conclusions, but they think it's a sign that this plan that they put in place could be working. We are confident that, you know, the, the plan that we have developed uh, across the U.S. government to address these flows uh, will work uh, over time. And we are, uh, again, uh, going to be, uh, you know, keeping a very, very close eye on, on all of this as it unfolds. We're also learning tonight the White House is trying to expand its Border Patrol app to let something like 1,000 people cross legally every day. At the same time, DHS says it sent something like 2,400 people back to Mexico and other countries in the past few days. Their big concern right now? Lawsuits from both sides of the aisle. The White House says that shows just how broken this immigration system actually is. More broadly, George Solis is in El Paso, Texas. And George, you've been talking to people. You know, I think one of the, one of the biggest things that you've talked about has been putting faces to the numbers that we're seeing, because there are a lot of statistics, right? There are a lot of people. These are people with stories and families, and they're telling you about them. Tell us more. Yeah, yeah Hallie, it's, uh, it's hard not to get emotional at some of the images that we've been seeing out here. Just moments ago, we saw young children walking with their families. Uh, who knows where, right? Maybe they're trying to get to shelter tonight. Maybe they're trying to uh, get away from this heat. But you know, as, a, as a parent, as I'm sure you as a parent, you know, you see these images again and again play out on television, and it cannot... You cannot un underscore just how much these people have been through as they try to come into this country, both illegally and legally. So, yes, the stories that we've been hearing here are absolutely heartbreaking. Some of the people here bearing this heat right now, still deciding whether or not they're going to go to a shelter or whether or not they're going to sleep on the street tonight because they just don't know what their options are. They are trying to navigate this new immigration landscape. Many of them trying to, as you mentioned, use that app, trying to hopefully get an appointment. And if those those that are lucky enough to, to navigate the CBB one app are, are still finding that it's not a perfect system for them. They, they realize that they'll have to either wait years before they see an immigration judge or find an appointment that's even miles away from where they are here today. And these are just, again, a, a small snippet of some of the images that we've been seeing over and over the last couple of days, because yes, they are not numbers. They are people, people with stories, and they really do feel that they are just caught in the worst situation possible. Hallie. Where does this go next then, George? I mean, just from a practical and pragmatic perspective, what happens from here as it relates to some of the, you know, overcrowding, DHS saying they're at capacity in some places, but also um, turning people away, et cetera? Right. So as we are here in one of these border towns right now, they tell us the situation is manageable, but they just don't know if that surge is coming day to day. They wonder if more people will come. And of course, more people are coming. We have seen that. So day to day, it's a wait and see game for a lot of the agencies and groups that are out here trying to provide some kind of uh, shelter and, and help for some of these people. They're also waiting to see what kind of assistance they'll get from the government to help fund more shelter and more food for these communities. Again, right now, some of these migrants are also not just staying here, but they're being moved to sanctuary cities, and many of them don't know where they're going to go from there. Again, many of them caught in that loophole waiting to see right. if their cases will be ever seen before a judge, and those now waiting to see if they do get those appointments through the app, they'll have to make that decision whether or not they cross illegally and, of course, risk that five-year ban from seeking asylum. All told, Hallie, it is a very dire situation here. George Solis live for us there right along the border in El Paso. Uh, George, thank you. In just the last few hours, we are hearing from the Treasury Secretary, who still thinks June 1st or right around there is going to be the time when the U.S. will run out of money to pay its bills. As President Biden seems to be, frankly, kind of chill about where the talks around preventing a debt ceiling crisis and maybe economic meltdown could happen. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy taking a bit of a different view. Listen. There's no progress that I see, and it really concerns me with the timeline of where we are. I remain optimistic because I'm a congenital optimist, but I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. Remember, what we're talking about here is the U.S. may be running out of money to pay what it owes, right? And if that happens, and by the way, it's never happened before, if it happens this time, experts say, hey, we could be in recession territory, stock market crash territory. You could all see soaring interest rates. It's all on the table if, if, if we were to miss that deadline. Here's the thing, though. With 15 days to go, Wall Street, 
they're having kind of chill vibes. Look at this. They're not super concerned. The Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ all up, right? No jitters there, at least not yet. And our team has some new reporting showing that most Americans are kind of yawning about this whole thing, telling us this debt ceiling crisis feels pretty abstract right now compared to all the very real issues people see around them every day. Kelly O'Donnell is live for us at the White House. And Kelly, part of this is because that so-called X date, right, the actual day when we're going to be in real big trouble, it's like a little malleable. It's like June 1st is early, but maybe a little later in June, but we don't really know. You know, what, what's up with the vibes here? Give us a vibe check. Well, one of the things that's different, Hallie, compared to when we were looking at government shutdowns, where at the stroke of midnight, right. the federal government would have to cease operations, it's not a hard deadline like that. This is a case where the Treasury Department is able to move money around. So mm -hmm. when tax receipts come in, they're able to pay certain bills. So there isn't a hard and fast deadline. The letter from the Treasury Secretary today was, uh, as she described it, updating Congress on how they are looking at what's coming in the door, what's going out the door for the federal government, and she is still comfortable with that June 1 window. She's also encouraging them to not push it to that point, and we know that often that's what happens in Washington. Things go until the last possible right. minute for resolution. So maybe you've got a little good cop, bad cop in the tone we're hearing from the president and the speaker. At the same time, uh, clearly all parties are saying we can't go into default. And perhaps some of the public uh, reaction is because the U.S. has never done that. We have seen government shutdowns. We have seen fiscal cliffs. We, yeah, I've covered those, so have you. Uh, yeah. People remember when you couldn't go to the Social Security office or you couldn't go to the National Park. This is different. And that may be part of why it's hard for people to conceptualize this. And uh, the kinds of cataclysmic issues, as you pointed out, recession, problems That's with right. the stock market, which affect, of course, people's retirement savings and everything else, uh, job losses, all of that could happen if they don't get this resolved. So oh. the negotiations are going on and we are waiting to see if they can have some kind of breakthrough. Okay, so vibe check there. Now give us a gut check because there's been a lot of talk about this idea of like the 14th Amendment. Um, and there is a bit of, I think, a reality check that I'm, I'm sure you and our team are, e are eager to deliver here. Talk us through how, what that even means and then how serious that talk is. Well, there's a provision within the 14th Amendment that says that you cannot uh, not pay the government's uh, bills. And that is something that hasn't been tested under the law. So the president has said he's open to that, but he doesn't see it as a solution right now, even though there are officials who are continuing to look at that, because it would likely have to be litigated. Is this applicable when Congress has the purse strings? Could the president invoke the 14th Amendment and say the good faith and credit of the federal government uh, for things like paying pensions and so forth can't be altered or, or missed in more common speech? So that's where the, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution gives some room for the executive branch to look at this. But because it hasn't been tested legally, they aren't sure it applies now. One of the things the president has said is maybe they ought to go through the legal process separate mm. from our current issue to see if that might be a long-term solution here. So I think everyone's looking at all kinds of possibilities. Uh, the negotiating that's going on at a staff level right now, and tomorrow the president has confirmed he does right. expect to meet with the top congressional leaders. Uh, they'll meet and talk about what staffers have been working on to see is there some room for them to cut some spending at some point and raise the debt limit. And after that meeting, Kel, are all signs a go, at least at this point, from the signals that the president will, in fact, go on that big overseas trip that, that's in the works? As he alluded as to, far as he, we know, is it maybe not, but... Yes, as far as we know, the president's plans are to still travel, and in part that is because uh, the, the White House believes there's a national security implication to this, yeah. that you've got to go and talk to those other leaders and reassure them that the U.S. is uh, going to be fiscally responsible, and there are big important issues to do that, and that the president is president wherever he is, and so he can be on the phone and negotiating, doesn't have to be in the room with Speaker McCarthy sure. uh, to do that. So at this point... The plans, and these, of course, are world summits with lots involved, uh, and so the expectation is to try to keep going on that. Could change, but no plan to change it just yet. Kelly O'Donnell, live for us there on the North Lawn. Good to see you, Kel. Thank you. We've got some other breaking news into us in the political front, you could say, in the last few hours. A special counsel report, years in the making, years. It is finally out tonight. It's the so-called investigation into the Russia investigation, right? And it accuses the FBI of acting improperly, negligently, 
by examining former President Donald Trump's alleged ties to Russia during 2016. This is a report, it's often shorthanded here in Washington, is like the Durham report. You may have heard it called that. That's because John Durham is the special counsel who came up with this, who's been working on this. And the report says that senior FBI personnel displayed a serious lack of analytical rigor, I'm quoting, in that 2016 investigation, which led to Robert Mueller's own special counsel investigation. Remember, Durham was appointed by a, at the time, Trump ally, his attorney general, Bill Barr, to look into how the Russia investigation started in the first place. The report does not recommend any new charges against FBI officials. Durham took a couple of people to court during this whole process, two of them found not guilty. The former president, listen, not a huge shock, right, that he likes what he's seeing from this report, posting on Truth Social that he says the American public was scammed by this investigation, period. And Ken, I, I want to just help put this into context here, right, because to use your own words, and our team thought they were very apt, I did, obviously I, I liked them, is that you said this will probably loom larger in the political sphere than in the sphere of law or the legal sphere, right? I mean, and that is how it seems to already be playing out. Is there anything in here that we didn't specifically know already, or does this seem more like like a political hot potato than a legal hot potato. There are a few new slivers of information, Hallie, that only the wonkiest of those of us who are following every jot and tittle of this investigation will even care about. But the bottom line here is it's, it's a rather remarkable 300-page report. John Durham does not even go as far as he did uh, back in 2019 when the Justice Department Inspector General released its own report and said the FBI was justified in opening this investigation and there was no political bias. Back then, Durham issued a statement saying he disagreed with that. In this report, he doesn't even go so far as to say the FBI, the FBI acted wrongly by opening this investigation. He, he, he accuses the FBI of slipshod work, essentially, and being too gullible and accepting information that was politically tainted, including the infamous Steele dossier. But um, really, for an investigation that has been billed by Donald Trump and others as, you know, uncovering the crime of the century, he finds no conspiracy, no corruption, not even actions by the FBI that can be attributed to political bias. Uh, essentially, this was like a performance audit of the FBI. And the FBI's position is, thank you very much. We've already made a number of changes. We, we recognize that some mistakes were made in this. We've made a number of changes in how we approach national security information. But so this will be seized on by Trump and his allies um, for, for the political benefit of it. And as a matter of law and really, you know, changing how the government does business won't have very much impact on there's also some, some contradictions to a separate report from the Department of Justice from a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's what I was alluding to. Sorry, I went too fast there. So back in 2019, the Department of Justice Inspector General, an independent watchdog that often, often criticizes the department, issued a report and found a lot of mistakes by the FBI, but found that fundamentally the FBI was justified in opening that crossfire hurricane investigation into whether the Trump campaign was coordinating, conspiring with Russia and that there was no political bias involved in making that decision. And at the end of the day, this report doesn't really change that conclusion, this report by Durham. The, the, I mean, Durham was more critical of the FBI than Michael Horowitz, the DOJ inspector general, but he doesn't really, you know, he doesn't really move the ball that much. I mean, he does add some interesting factoids about information that, that had to pertain to the Hillary Clinton campaign uh, that the FBI may have treated differently. But of course, the context was entirely different. Donald Trump was publicly appealing to Russia at the time to find the missing Hillary Clinton emails. He was saying nice things about Putin. So there's a whole context to, with Trump and Russia that was not mentioned in this Durham report. Um, we're seeing even tonight, in the last couple of minutes here, just to, to your point on the politics of it all, right, from Nikki Haley, who is, of course, running for president, a 2024 Republican primary candidate, saying that this Durham report, she says, is damn, in her words, damning evidence of the rot in our government. She says there must be consequences. What, I, and I know you don't have a crystal ball. I'm not going to ask you to, to predict what consequences could come here. But when it comes to actual action out of this report, Will this be a situation where we'll see Congress kind of along party lines talking about this a lot and that's kind of where it ends? Or, or what comes out of this tangibly, Ken? Anything? Well, so the FBI has already made a lot of changes, but what's going to come out of this is there's a, an important FISA renewal, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Section 702, which is how the intelligence community does a lot of their spying. That is up for renewal in Congress, and Republicans are holding the FBI, holding their feet to the fire over these very issues and demanding reforms. And so if there's any impact to this, it makes it a lot harder for the FBI to ask for what's known as a clean bill to renew that law, which they say is crucial to so many things, counterterrorism, counterintelligence, cyber. 
So this will have real world consequences. And it's something, as you said, all Republicans can agree on this. Nikki Haley, you, can, you don't have to be, you can be a never Trumper, you can be a tr pro Trumper. They all agree somehow that the FBI, there's rot at the heart of the FBI, which is kind of a remarkable thing for the Republican Party, which used to be the law enforcement, law and order party. How? Ken Delanian, um, it's a lot to unpack. You have unpacked it well. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's take you overseas now, where the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, is heading back home tonight with the pledge of new military support from allies in Europe ahead of what everybody expects to be an attack on Russian forces. You have Zelensky putting out a video saying, we're returning home with new defense packages, more new and powerful weapons, more protection for our people, more political support. That political support he's talking about comes after the meetings that you see here, right, with leaders in the U.K., France, Germany, Italy, where Zelensky, by the way, also met with the Pope. Back at his home in Ukraine, you have the military there saying it's forced the Russians to retreat more than a mile from Bakhmut, a key city in the eastern Donbass region. Kier Simmons is joining us now. Um, and Kier, you have talked about how this is, you know, a pivotal moment for Ukraine. And you have Zelensky heading back home, sort of saying, look at everything we have now, the things that we've wanted, money, billions of dollars in help from Germany, tanks, equipment, et cetera. Um, talk us through what this means for Zelensky and where things stand on the ground. Well, President Zelensky is still saying that he would like fighter jets, highly uh, F-16s. Uh, there is now a promise from the UK to train Ukrainian pilots, but still not a promise for the jets to be sent. But he, he's getting so much more. He's, he's getting more of those uh, Leopard tanks. He, he's getting more of those Abrams tanks from, from there in, in the US, uh, arriving in Germany uh, right now. And they are difficult to maneuver, obviously. And that makes a point, which is that just because you hear uh, these countries talk about offering or giving a military aid to Ukraine, it then takes time for it to arrive. I mean, Germany just, to, just uh, over the weekend, Hallie, uh, three, almost three billion dollars worth of military aid. I mean, it really is a big push. Why is it happening? Well, it's happening, I suppose you could argue in one sense, because really the European Europeans, those that support Ukraine uh, and the US, don't have any choice but to double down. They need to see Ukraine gain more territory, because inevitably at some point there will be negotiations. And it seems very unlikely that those negotiations would involve actual handing over of territory. That's going to happen on the battlefield. So, so that's why and, and British officials have been saying to me for some time that this has been the ambition. And now you're hearing it in Paris and you're hearing it in Berlin. You, yeah. the, 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 that's why uh, the Europeans are pushing, 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 because they want to help the Ukrainians to get back land fundamentally before a deal is done. Talk about the quote unquote negotiations that China wants to have, right? That China's getting involved in, this envoy who's mm. um, traveling around to these various entities here over the next few days. Talk through, w w will that make a difference? What's the sense? Yeah, the conversations I've had with Chinese officials um, in recent months have left me with, it, with the impression, I don't think it's really uh, that controversial, that they're not too concerned about territory. You know, fundamentally, they just want to see a deal done, an armistice, perhaps not even a peace deal, just a ceasefire, something that stops this. Because for China, of course, and remember just how crucial Europe is to China economically, it's a huge trading partner. This is a, is a, is a real pain now, this war. I mean, clearly it's far worse if you're Ukrainian, or you, even if you are uh, living in those eastern Ukraine territories and you consider yourself Russian, whichever. But, but for uh, China, uh, they are pushing, pushing now to try and get a diplomatic solution. Uh, Hali, three separate senior Chinese diplomats on three tours of, uh, of, of Europe uh, and <laughs> trying to get some, some kind of talks going. We'll see, though. I think there has to be more fighting before we get there. Kier Simmons, live for us with all of that. Kier, thank you so much. Appreciate it. We've got some more breaking news just into us in the world of politics here. A new lawsuit out of New York accusing former President Trump's former personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, of offering to sell pardons by his former boss. It's a lawsuit filed by a former employee of Giuliani's accusing him of sexual assault, harassment, wage theft. According to the lawsuit, Giuliani allegedly asked the former employee if she knew anybody who needed a pardon, saying he'd tell that, sell them for $2 million that would be split between him and Mr. Trump. The lawsuit also says Giuliani allegedly told her not to go through the, and I'm quoting here, normal channels for a pardon, because then that'd be subject to disclosures under the Freedom of Information Act.
you're out to the Giuliani team, to the Trump campaign for any statement or reaction. Have not heard back yet. Vaughn Hilliard is reporting this out for us and is joining us now. Walk us through the allegations, and I think importantly, Vaughn, is there any evidence that has been presented against Giuliani in this lawsuit here? In terms of evidence, Hallie, that is the key question, because right. uh, this woman, who is an associate, says that she was hired in 2019 by Rudy Giuliani, says that with his consent, she made recordings of numerous conversations that they had, whether that specific conversation about the allegation of $2 million pardon for sale and splitting it with Donald Trump, whether that was recorded, is not made clear here in this lawsuit. But the question is, what is she presenting here? Because the uh, the allegations here are, are, are damning and, frankly, difficult to read. Of course, that one has potential 2024 political implications involving the former president of the United States. But she, I think, m more importantly, makes allegations of of sexual assault, sexual harassment against Rudy Giuliani over the course of years. And this, for Giuliani, we have reached out to uh, an attorney of his. We have not heard back from comment at this time. We have reached out uh, to the plaintiff here in this case as well. We have not heard from her. We've also reached out to the Trump campaign. The, what is laid out here in this lawsuit that we just got our hands on about an hour ago are difficult and, of course, uh, uh, yeah. worthy of a lot of questions. Uh, step back for a sec, Vaughn, the yeah. relationship more broadly between Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani has shifted over the years. It's shifted over the years. And frankly, this is the man that I think we need to be uh, frank about is the man that he turned to in 2020 and in the aftermath of his election loss. Uh, he was his personal lawyer that he sent around the country to go and make the case of state legislatures that, in fact, that they should overturn their election results. And the other parts of this lawsuit uh, are uh, uh, worth noting, particularly because she alleges that he forced her to perform sexual acts on him while he was engaged in conversations with individuals, including the former president himself, Donald Trump. While they had conversations not only pertaining to the 2020 election, but also the Mueller probe, uh, confidential conversations that she said that she should not have been privy to. Vaughn Hilliard, uh, reporting that out, continuing to ask those questions for us. Vaughn, thank you, as always. Still ahead here on the show, secondhand safety, with parents raising some alarms about using pre-owned baby equipment. What well, you should know about kids' hand-me-downs. Plus, she may be synonymous with recipes and home decor. Now Martha Stewart has an eye-catching addition to her resume. Stay with us. New numbers show a lot of parents find it really tough to tell if the secondhand stuff they buy for their kids is actually safe. Half of parents in the U.S. say they've bought used baby gear, used kid gear like cribs and high chairs. But two-thirds say it's hard to know whether that is actually okay for their child, according to a new study out from the University of Michigan. Parents are overwhelmingly likely to inspect these things for damage, right? Look to see if any pieces are broken. Most parents say they're going to sanitize this stuff, of course, make sure they're clean. But only about half say they're likely to do an Internet search for instructions on how to set up and use the equipment, or importantly, so importantly, to check if it's been recalled. Dr. Kavita Patel joins us now. Dr. Patel... Baby stuff can be expensive, right? And there's a lot of it that you only use for a really short period of time. So, of course, using something that's a hand-me-down, pre-owned, buying it cheaper makes sense for a lot of families here. The tricky part is when, for example, a popular item has been recalled. I think of the Fisher-Price Rock and Play. We've covered it here on this show, an item that was recalled. NBC News has been at the tip of the spear of the issues with those things showing up on... Facebook Marketplace, for example, the CPSC, concerned about that. Um, what are parents supposed to do, right? Like, what is the, what is, what, what do you tell parents here? Yeah, Hallie, uh, to your point, it's no wonder that looking for secondhand goods is a very popular thing to do when even just the first year of life, it could be five to $15,000 just to get wow. all those accessories. And in this case, Hallie, I hate to say it, but newer is probably better when it comes to safety. Here's actually what the communications director for the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Pamela Springs, had to say about that very question. Regulation and rules around children's products um, have been changing a lot over the past couple of years. And so if someone is selling something that was for example, uh, made in 2010 or earlier, you may not want to buy that product. So 
so as you kind of see here, Hallie, what you're hearing is not just newer is better, but you really need to think about what you're purchasing. And that yeah. also is for people donating, that you need to think about what you're donating. Your intentions might be good, but it might not serve the best interests of the child that you're donating that to. Do you know what I think about that with when it comes to car seats? I mean, you know, like infant car seats are different from when right. they get a little bit bigger and heavier or taller or whatever, which is different from the next one. But that's something, right, that you're not really supposed to to donate because people might not know has right. it been in a crash, et cetera, right? Like what steps would give us some news you can use, if you will, right? Like the steps people yeah. need to think through. Yeah, absolutely. So number one, doing your research and checking for those recalls. You just need to get on the internet. This Consumer Product Safety Commission has a great website, cpfc.gov. That's one place to start. And then to your point about installation directions, you should, even if you receive an item and it's from a trusted source, even a sibling or a hand-me-down from a family member, look on the internet for the installation directions. Don't just take word of mouth because sometimes those instructions are updated. And then if you're donating, do your own diligence. Sometimes you have things Things, you don't even realize there was a recall. You didn't send in that warranty card. All of us have been there. You need to make sure that you're doing your own diligence when you're about to send that to a social media marketplace, even if it's free, because it can come at some harm if it's not safe. Yeah, that's a great point. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you very much. Important stuff there. No wonder those new numbers are out showing that parents are stressing. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, President Biden announcing today he's nominating the next director of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Monica Bertinoli. She's been the director of the National Cancer Institute since last October, where Mr. Biden says she moved forward his cancer. The president says she moved forward his cancer moonshot push. The White House describing her as a world-renowned surgical oncologist, cancer researcher, educator, and physician leader. Number two, Microsoft's proposed nearly $70 billion acquisition of Activision Blizzard, that gaming company. It's a step closer to reality. Remember, this is the company that brought us Call of Duty and World of Warcraft. This is a huge deal that the EU has given its stamp of approval. Regulators in the UK had blocked the deal. They had said the agreement would reduce competition. Still TBD on whether the US will approve it. Number three, experts at AAA say travel on Memorial Day weekend is gonna be one for the record books. Those are their words, okay, not ours. That's what they say. With more than 42 million Americans traveling at least 50 miles from home for the unofficial kickoff to summer. You know that's gonna mean a ton of people on the highways, at train stations, at airports. It's up 7% from last year. Air travel alone is expected to go up 11% over the year before. Number four, have you seen this yet? It's probably been all over your socials. Martha Stewart making history as the oldest Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover model ever. She's 81. She told the magazine she was motivated not by money, but to show people that women her age can still look good, feel good, be good. The issue is going to be on stands Thursday. Number five, happy birthday to this old guy, Bobby. The people at the Guinness Book of World Records say this Portuguese dog is the oldest dog in the world. In dog years, he's 31. In people years, he's like 200 something. Bobby has lived in the same village his whole life. His owner, of course, threw him a party, meat and fish and everything good for that. That good boy. Coming up here on the show, on the road again and again and again, why more Americans are holding on to cars longer than ever before. Stay with us. With cars getting more and more expensive, more and more of us are now spending more and more money to fix up our old cars rather than replace them with new ones. Guess how long people on average keep their cars? 12 and a half years. Can you believe that number? That's the average age. That's about how old, like, the average car on the road actually is. You can blame the pandemic in part, right, because they made cars more expensive. The pandemic did because of those big shipping delays, the manufacturing backlogs. Prices have not really gone down since then. Then you add on top of this loan rates getting higher and higher for new car buying because of all those interest rate hikes. It's moved the national average of auto loan payments to a record $730 a month. That means the average amount of money that people are spending on a new car payment in this country is more than $700 a month. So all of those numbers put together means more people are saying, hey, I'm going to stick with what I got, even if I pour more money into it by fixing it up. Caleb Silver is joining us now. Um, it, it's not cheap to do repair and maintenance on a car, but it is, in the eyes of many people, cheaper than going out and paying all that money for a new car, right? Explain that. Is that the smart economic move here? 
Yeah, for a lot of people, because that new car purchase is the ultimate discretionary purchase. And we're talking about new cars averaging around $48,000 just to get a new car. Used cars are around $26,000, $27,000. So if you're making that big purchase and you have great credit, you're still paying upwards of 700 bucks a month, as you alluded to, whereas you could put a couple grand in to fix it up. A lot of people are choosing that option. You're seeing AutoZone, O'Reilly, a lot of these auto repair companies do very well because people are making that decision now versus the auto dealers themselves and the car makers, which aren't doing that great because we're just not buying as many new cars as we used to. If this trend continues, what does it mean for those big car companies, right? Like, what is the impact of people hanging on to their old cars longer? Yeah, that drives them crazy because their business is in <laughs> transactions. They need to sell, move units, sell new cars to make room for the next model. And that's the way the cycles work for years and years. But it's just not working anymore because these interest rates are so high right now. The cost of a new car is so high right now, too. And you see a lot of these automakers transitioning to all electric vehicles. There's a bigger appetite for that. The average age of an electric vehicle, by the way, about 3.6 years. So those are still kind of old for new vehicles. You're seeing this transition happen in the auto industry continue to accelerate. That's what we're going to see for the next few years. I'm so glad you brought up electric vehicles because I was going to ask you, Caleb, what this means for EVs, right? Like if people are holding on to their old, let's say, gas cars 12 and a half years ago, almost certainly, gas-powered cars longer, does it mean that there could be, like, are EV cars just as expensive as gas powered like, like, help me understand that piece of it. Yeah, well, prices are coming down for electric vehicles, but you still have to deal with other things like the charging of it all. And insurance is around two grand a year, whether it's electric or non-electric. But you're seeing a lot more adoption of EVs, but there's still only less than 3% of the total cars out there on the market right now, only about 3 million of them out there. There's about 284 million cars on the road today. Caleb Silver, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Still ahead, the history that's been taught for decades that may be fabricated. We'll take you inside what we're learning tonight about the relationship between MLK and Malcolm X in tonight's backstory. We'll be right back. Time now to get the backstory, our behind-the-scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we're looking at an extraordinary new revelation about one of the defining tensions of the civil rights era, that fiery criticism that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. aimed at Malcolm X, arguably the two biggest black leaders of that era. Turns out, that criticism may have come out of thin air. The writer Jonathan Igg discovered a full, never-before-published transcript of a long 1965 Playboy interview with MLK, showing he may not have said what the article says he did. We want to show it to you here side by side, right? So you, like, just to give you a sense of this. So in the Playboy article, you see it on the left, Dr. King is quoted as saying, I feel that Malcolm has done himself and our people a great disservice. But in the full transcript, that line doesn't show up anywhere. When the article... Back on the left side here, it says Dr. King said, and I'm, I'm quoting here, that fiery demagogic oratory in the black ghettos urging Negroes to arm themselves and prepare to engage in violence can achieve nothing but negative results. That line from MLK seems like he's criticizing Malcolm X. But look at the transcript. Turns out that line shows up way earlier. Dr. King says that phrase in a totally different context that doesn't have anything to do with Malcolm X. So how did this happen? Some of the controversy now focuses on this man, Alex Haley, that really famous journalist who did the 1965 interview with MLK. He's a big deal. Wrote a book about Malcolm X. He won a Pulitzer Prize for the novel Roots, right, which inspired that very popular TV show of the same name. But over the years, he's faced a lot of criticism for alleged plagiarism and lying. Jonathan Eig is the author of King, A Life, which comes out tomorrow. He joins us now. So talk about this, because for, for decades, this matters, right? For decades, this MLK interview has been held up as kind of this defining tension of the civil rights era between two of the most prominent black leaders at the time. Tell us, how did you even come about this, this, this these transcripts as you were doing research for the book? How did that even happen? King and Malcolm X have always been portrayed as antagonists. And the longest interview we have with King is the interview that appeared in Playboy magazine. And that interview was conducted by Alex Haley. So anytime I find a really good interview, I go to the archives. I try to find the notes or the tapes from that interview to see what was left out of the story. And in this case, I found Alex Haley's notes or the transcripts of his interviews at the uh, university library at Duke. And those transcripts were very different from what was published in Playboy magazine. And many of the quotes that, was, that were published where King was most critical of Malcolm X were not in the transcripts at all. King never said most of them. So I was shocked and um, really felt like 
the record needed to be set straight because history teachers, um, especially African American history teachers in yeah. colleges, have been teaching that quote for 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 decades, for generations. So then, how did you sort of wrestle down this revelation? In other words, like once you kind of got past the initial shock of like, wow, this thing may not be what it seems based on these transcripts. You then, you know, went went about directly disputing this narrative that, as you point out, is built into in some worlds of academia, right, into classroom settings, et cetera. Well, first I broke it down. I, I really analyzed the two documents carefully, the published interview and the transcript, to see what King actually said. And it's important because what he actually said is, I don't like Malcolm's calls to violence, but I also don't believe that I have all the answers. So he was suggesting an openness to mm -hmm. talking to Malcolm and to understanding where Malcolm was coming from. And that's very different from what we're teaching. So I discovered this uh, about a year ago, and I had to sit on it for a while um, because I wanted to save it for my book, of course. But at the same time, I shared it with a lot of uh, history professors around the country to make sure they knew about it and that they would uh, begin to think about how to teach this differently and also to learn from them, to get advice from them on, on why this mattered, really. There is also, you have described a level of urgency here to the work that you're doing, specifically as it relates to, um, to, to Dr. King here. You said in an interview that we were interested in with the New York Times Book Review that if your approach to the book, if I do nothing but travel the country for the next year or two, interviewing people who knew MLK, my time will have been well spent. Explain that, right? Because time is not an infinite resource here. Well, it ended up being six years, um, but I still think it was time well spent because I had the opportunity to meet people who knew and worked with Martin Luther King Jr. And when I told my kids about this, they thought it was impossible. They thought Martin Luther King Jr. must be 200 years old by now. But in fact, he'd only be 94. And in fact, his older sister is still alive. And I found dozens of people who knew him well, childhood playmates. I found his barber. I found the pianist, the organist at his church um, in, in Montgomery. So I was just having the best time of my life and learning so much. How did you, you know, and you, you touched on this a bit, too, in that same interview, but I want to draw this out more here, how you approached wanting to add this, this sort of new telling of one of America's most prominent black leaders as yourself a white man at a time where there may be people who were looking for somebody who might have a different lived experience in, in this kind of writing here. How did you think about that? With humility, I mean, anytime you enter into a biography of any subject, you're taking someone else's life in your own hands. When you take Dr. King's life in your own hands, as someone who's an icon, especially an icon mm -hmm. in the black community, you have to work extra hard and be extra sensitive. And I tried to surround myself with experts. I tried to learn from the people who knew King and to learn from our best historians so that I could um, you know, make up for whatever blind spots I might have, but also just account for my gaps with hard work. And um, as I said, the opportunity to, to interview um, people before, you know, we lose the last living witnesses to King's life was just too important. I couldn't resist. Jonathan Ike, thank you so much for talking us through the behind the scenes look at how this all came together. Uh, quite the story. Really appreciate it. Thank you. We have an update now to some of that news we brought you earlier in that hour. We have a statement now from Rudy Giuliani, that former Donald Trump attorney, responding to a lawsuit filed against him for alleged sexual assault, harassment, and wage theft. An advisor to Giuliani says he unequivocally denies the allegations filed by this former employee, accusing her of taking part in, and I'm quoting here, prior schemes to defraud high net worth men, citing the New York Post on that. The advisor says Giuliani's lifetime of public service speaks for itself, and he will pursue all available remedies and counterclaims. He did not specifically address an allegation that Giuliani offered to sell pardons from former President Trump. We're going to bring you more on this story as we get it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. In Kenya, one of the country's oldest wild lions was killed by herders. He was 19 years old. Kenya's government thinks lots of wild lions have been killed in just the last week, like 10 of them, perhaps. Tensions between humans and animals have been escalating there because of a bad drought. The country's tourism minister met with locals Sunday and urged them not to kill wandering lions, said just reach out to wildlife services. In Thailand, thousands of people gathering in Bangkok today after the main opposition party outperformed projections. Seems like folks there want to change after more than a decade under military rule. The incumbent leader took power in a military coup and has been blamed for a sluggish economy and a rocky response to the pandemic. Still TBD, who's going to be prime minister now. Out of Australia and a landmark conserva conservation project. Look at this, the country's 
iconic platypus was reintroduced into its oldest national park. It had disappeared from the area about 50 years ago. This is the first attempt to try to get this species reintroduced to the wild. Experts say it's an important conservation tool for the future of the platypus there. Up next, TV networks trying to push forward even with this writer's strike already affecting some of the enthusiasm of what you could be watching come the fall. Stay with us. That big Hollywood writer's strike casting a shadow over the start of a major week for major media companies as they try to charm advertisers at what's called upfronts. NBC Universal, our parent company, and Fox kicking off day one. But look who was outside, at least Radio City Music Hall. Protesters from the Writers Guild lining the streets there as the strike hit its third week now. That's putting the pause on a whole lot of shows. You know, these upfronts, these presentations are often focused on showing advertisers what they're going to see content-wise this year, right? What movies, what shows are coming out. And the strike added kind of this interesting new dimension or new layer to this whole thing. NBC Universal having to also acknowledge the other elephant in the room. It's global ad chief, Linda Yaccarino, resigning last week to replace Elon Musk as Twitter's CEO. I want to bring in NBC's Dana Griffin. Did, it, did, there, did the upfronts feel a little different this year, given the writer's strike? It did seem like, you know, there was a shadow over some of them um, based on what we've seen so far. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And the big, the noticeable difference is the scale back on that celebrity power, the star power that we're used to seeing. You did have some like Reba McIntyre who performed live, but when you have a writer strike going on right now, you're not going to see a lot of the writers and creators in the room. And it was most noticeable. One of the prominent moments was when there was a spot highlighting the 50th anniversary of SNL. And Hallie, not a single former or current cast member was live to kind of present that you had today's show anchor Willie Geis kind of you know introducing that segment and said hey if you squint you know a little bit I, I look like Colin Jost uh, you also had some other segments uh, that were pre-taped before the writer strike began that featured Amy Poehler and Dick Wolf and so it just highlighted the fact that they weren't there in person which is a thing that most advertisers you know come to see, to see the big stars as they present the new fall lineup. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if that plays an impact um, on the ad revenue that's generated uh, come fall. Hallie? Yeah. What else do we know about, like, the writer's strike? And I don't know if we know this negotiations, how they're going. We know they're ongoing. But, like, the timeline is really, it's like a huge question mark with that strike, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. We know that there's a lot of back and forth um, and there was one topic that had to do with AI um, that they're still kind of going back and forth on. But the big question is, how long is this going to last? Yeah. You may remember the 2017, or so, excuse me, the 20, the 2007, 2008 writer strike that lasted 100 days, and it cost the industry an estimated two billion dollars. That is something that these networks are not looking to repeat, yeah. especially in an economy that we're like we're, what we're seeing right now. And obviously, the writers are also interested in striking a deal because they want to work and they want to provide for themselves. Hallie. Dana Griffin, live for us there out in L.A. Dana, thank you so much. Good to see you. That does it for this hour and for the one before it. If you missed any of it, catch up on the latest reporting and the newest interviews from our team. You can find us anytime in so many places. Peacock, Hulu, YouTube, and more. Just search Hallie Jackson now. It is good to be with you tonight. As always, we'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Top Story picks up coverage right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.